Welcome. Jack Welch, you are the chairman of Book of Mormon Central currently, but you also were heavily involved in FARMS, the Foundation for Ancient Research in Mormon Studies back in the day, and you were the editor of BYU Studies for many, many years. And so in some ways, you're an intellectual and professional heir to Hugh Nibley. Um, but to understand why we're doing this book, could you just give us a brief synopsis of who was Hugh Nibley and why would we do a book devoted to him? Who was Hugh Nibley? Many, many people that I ran into outside of Utah asked me that question. Uh, when I was at Duke going to law school, I slipped over to the uh, uh, religion department there. They have a school of theology there. And uh, I was using the library for various uh, research projects that I had. And so I had a lot of conversations with people, and they would, some of them knew the name Nibley. Uh, one of them, uh, W.D. Davies, had actually come to the University of Utah and spent, uh, I don't know whether it was a semester or a year, but was here in Utah, and was fascinated with uh, LDS doctrine, especially dealing with the sanctity of the earth and the land. And as a Jewish scholar, he was interested in the promised land and that sort of concept. Well, he ran across Nibley, and he had to say, well, tell me, who was Nibley? Exactly your question. And why was he interested? Well, during the 1950s and early 60s, he was publishing up a storm in, uh, in academic journals. Uh, he was publishing in the top-tier journals on ancient, uh, ancient history, early Christianity. And where did he come from? No one, he wasn't in the mainstream of, you know, Harvard, Yale, and Eastern schools. He'd been to California, but he'd graduated back in the 30s, and World War II had interrupted all of that, and then he just comes out of nowhere. Uh, he becomes friends with uh, Klaus Baer at the University of Chicago. He met him kind of uh, when he was, uh, when Baer was there at Berkeley, and uh, Hugh decided he was going to go spend some time there on a kind of sabbatical in the early 60s. But again, uh, he, he was so prolific and so striking in the way he approached problems. And uh, his footnotes, of course, were elaborate and extensive. Uh, I remember Jim Charlesworth asking me this question. Tell me about Hugh. Who is Hugh Nibley? And I said, well, uh, tell me what you want to know. And he said, well, we are now working on the pseudepigrapha of the Old Testament. And right now we're working on the Enoch material. And I can tell that he's written, Nibley's written some things on Enoch. It shows up in some places. But what we're doing is we're sitting around. We have Enoch texts in Ethiopic, in Syriac, in Greek. In, I have to have a whole room full of people to be able to compare these translations and texts. But Nibley could do that all by himself because he knows all of these. <laughs> so I have to have Hugh Nibley on my project. And I said, well, I'll try. Uh, and to finish that little story, I, I did contact Hugh and say, you know, this is a great opportunity. You could work with these people on uh, the materials that you are deeply involved in and probably know better than anyone else in the world right now because very few people had spent time on the pseudepigrapha at that point. And Hugh kind of smiled and brushed me off and said, there's not enough time. The second coming is too short. <laughs> uh, and really, and he, he had actually had a heart attack not long after that. So uh, maybe, you know, prophetically he knew how to spend his time. But, uh, but he just uh, uh, was sought after and people wondered about who he was. Now that's outside, where we had people outside of uh, Utah who were well aware of who he was, uh, but uh, also who was Hugh Nibley in terms of the church here in, uh, uh, in Utah and church scholarship and BYU. Uh, he, was, uh, he was a lighthouse. Uh, he was a beacon for a whole generation of, of students who came to his classes, no matter what he was teaching, uh, 
it didn't matter what it said in the catalog, what the title of the class was. The class was always Hugh Nibley. Whatever he was thinking about, he would talk about as he walked in the door, he would continue talking as he walked out the door. Wow. And my first semester as a freshman, he was my Honors Book of Mormon teacher. And who was he? Who was Nibley? Well, I didn't even know that that very year uh, the approach to the Book of Mormon was going to come out as a book from Deseret Book. Now, it had appeared earlier as a Melchizedek Priesthood Manual in 1957, and I knew a little bit about that, but, but during that very semester, that book came out, and so people throughout the church again knew of him, but I, I just want you to know he never mentioned that book coming out in class. If you can imagine publishing a book and not even saying, oh, look, guys, look what I just did. <laughs> <laughs> but he was always on to something else. And uh, one other you know, funny little story that will just tell you a little bit about who he was. Uh, there were never empty seats in his classrooms. Students would line up outside the doors to, uh, you know, just to slip in and listen. And the honors program at BYU you know, started uh, to give students a small classroom experience. And uh, so I was a little surprised at how big that classroom was. It was in the old Joseph Smith building. I wasn't surprised, however, when the, the first midterm, our, our midterm exam came. And I walked into our room and looked around, and there were only four or five of us there. And I said, are we in the wrong room? <laughs> and the guy next to me said, no, we're the only ones stupid enough to be taking this for a grade. <laughs> I said, oh, okay. But, but that was the kind of magnetism that his, uh, his knowledge, his spirit, his enthusiasm. Uh, now, I had heard about Hugh Nibley from Doug Collister, who later became a, a 70. Uh, he was at uh, USC Law School in Los Angeles and was my 10th grade Sunday school teacher. Uh, and uh, he regaled us constantly of, with Hugh Nibley stories. He had had a class from Hugh Nibley. And I don't know whether it's for a grade or not, but, <laughs> <laughs> but he had, uh, you know, he he's told me once, you know, and told the class, I, I remember walking up to, to Hugh after uh, uh, a lecturer asking if I could see his notes. I just wanted to get a few things. And he said, well, I'm sorry, the notes today are in Arabic. <laughs> <laughs> wow. <laughs> but, uh, okay, so all these are just to say uh, he is not an ordinary doorman, uh, although he thought of himself as one of my pieces in this volume uh, will, will say that he was a, a doorkeeper in the house of the Lord. And that's how he preferred to describe himself. Of course, he's quoting uh, a passage from the Psalms there. Right. In your chapter, on, in the foreword to this volume, Hugh Nibley observed, uh, you reference Psalm 8410, I would rather be a doorkeeper in the house of the Lord than mingle with the top brass in the tents of the wicked. And so uh, you're saying that Hugh Nibley really saw himself in that light. Could you just maybe comment on on why he related so much to that metaphor of being the doorman in the house of the Lord? Uh, well, uh, I never asked him that question. I'm sure he would have a much better answer than I will give you. Uh, but Hugh had a gen genuine humility, uh, largely because he knew so much and was also aware of how little he yet lacked. Uh, we think if we only knew as much as he did, we would know everything. Well, he, he, he knew that there was an exponential uh, dimension to increasing your knowledge. When you, when you know, you know, ten things, well, then you, they kind of interrelate a little bit, but the relationships would be maybe ten squared, a hundred, when you draw all the lines between those ten. Well, if you know a thousand things, now you know a million connections. <laughs> So this interaction between what you know in one setting and how that will then uh, 
transfer and shed light on other parts of what you know. It, it simply, when, when you have a mind like his that was constantly drawing connections, uh, he was truly interdisciplinary, not that he was disciplined in lots of different things, but his, his knowledge was completely interactive. It was like he could have 50 different documents opened at the same time in his mind and, and working uh, you know, beside them, uh, working simultaneously with them all. Now, that brings, a, that brings to your character a, a sense of, of, of real humility, that there's so much more out there. The expanding gospel was one of the topics, the title that he gave to his distinguished faculty lecture. Uh, he was the second distinguished faculty lecturer at BYU, and his topic was the expanding gospel. And why do I remember that? Well, uh, I was a freshman the year that was given. He'd been my teacher the semester before, and I was one of the many who crammed into a room to hear him speak <laughs> about the expanding gospel. So being a doorkeeper meant nothing like, uh, you know, just being a slouch or a lowly, yeah, he realized he was a lowly person. He, he went to the temple uh, all the time, I, at least a couple times a month, and he would walk all the way up to the temple and back, uh, thinking, muttering to himself, uh, but he would go and he would then talk to himself on the way back what he had learned. And uh, of course the temple was just, he talked about the temple in ways that nobody had ever even dreamed of thinking about. And so all of his stuff on uh, seeing connections with Egyptian temple worship and uh, uh, our LDS endowment and temple. Uh, so that's the kind of doorkeeper he was in the house of the Lord. Uh, he did not see himself as a gatekeeper. He wasn't trying to keep anyone out. Uh, and uh, in fact, he wanted everyone in. And so he was there as the welcoming committee uh, for the, the doors of the house of the Lord. I really love how you ended your foreword to the volume. In a word, Hugh Nibley is no ordinary doorman, but then as far as that goes, he doesn't stand by ordinary doorways either. And I think that goes to your comment on him loving the temple, attending the temple, and bringing to the Latter-day Saint community so much understanding and knowledge about the temple. And for me, that's been one of his greatest influences on my life. And I think that's one of his significant contributions is his study of the temple. From your perspective, what are some of the great contributions that Nibley's made? Well, well, the collected works of Hugh Nibley, uh, as people know, uh, contains 19 volumes. Wow. And the, the topics range so widely from antiquity to modernity. I mean, he was up to date on what was happening this week uh, with, uh, you know, people People don't realize that in the 1960s we, we had race riots. Uh, this may come as a shock to people, but uh, because these things have been uh, simply dropped from the collective memory that Watts and Detroit and Newark burned, whole cities set on fire as a result of, uh, well, partly the uh, assassination of uh, Martin Luther King, but also Bobby Kennedy. And I mean, things were really, really troublesome. And there were protests. I was, these are my college years. And there were hippies at Aid Ashbury and, you know, but Nibley was aware of all of these developments. And what he constantly found were answers to these problems. We think that nobody's ever had these problems before. And here we are trying to figure it out just muddling our way through. And because of all of his knowledge, he could say, you know, in fourth century Athens, they had exactly the same problem. Or in the Byzantine Empire in the sixth century, 
AD. Uh, you know, it, here's what they were doing there, and so he uh, he wrote articles like uh, the rise of rhetoric and the decline of everything else, how to have a quiet campus ancient style. <laughs> but he's interacting with current affairs, but drawing on the wisdom of the ages. I think that was one of the main contributions that he had. He didn't see history as a museum where you just went in and looked at objects and left. Uh, these were lessons from the past. And we used to always say uh, in the history department, those who don't learn from the past are condemned to repeat its failures. And uh, I think Nibley took history seriously. He took the scriptures seriously as history. Uh, sure, they were written by people who had their own perspectives and their vocabulary didn't translate easily into ours and sometimes you couldn't know exactly what they meant by things. What does Isaiah mean? Well, you don't give up on that. But by study and prayer and research, you can come pretty close to what his problems were and then how they can compare to our problems. And uh, I think that Nibley, maybe more than any other scholar that we'd ever had in the church, had this, uh, uh, he had a dispensational view of seeing the gospel even from the time before Adam, and he wrote an article before Adam, <laughs> and uh, matriarchy and patriarchy. I mean, he's already talking about human nature and the, you know, the world that we live in, but clearly informed by not just what happened in Joseph Smith's day, but early Christianity. Why did, why did Christianity go the directions that it did, not all of which were salutary. And, you know, here we are, kind of asking ourselves the same questions. Where are we going? Quo vadis? And uh, anyway, I, I'd say that that's a roundabout way of trying to answer your question about uh, what were his most important contributions. Uh, I think they all kind of center around uh, that uh, conviction uh, that uh, uh, human nature is, uh, although we know a lot more than we used to about a lot of things, human nature itself has not changed dramatically. At least that was his, one of his axioms. Certainly so. His profound study of history and antiquity is clearly still very presciently relevant to us today as uh, we see ourselves repeating some of the similar cycles of history. Um, you talked about the collected works of Hugh Nibley, and that's a 19 volume set of all of his books and writings that were published by farms. Could you comment a little bit on how that project got started? Uh, well, it, it actually started with bibliographies, people, just wanted to keep a bibliography of what you had written. And people were asking questions. People were writing him letters. I remember uh, in his office, he had a, a big cardboard box. And I looked in it once and, you know, the, the bottom half of it was filled with, it looked like letters to Santa Claus, you know, just letters from random people. But all of them to him. He would, you know, he had in the 1950s and early 60s, he published in almost every month of the improvement era. So he was almost doing as much work, Jasmine, as you, putting out <laughs> no <Sorry>. wise and <laughs> No, but what we do with Book of Mormon Central with this constant stream of, of new information, well, he was doing this through the improvement era, and, uh, and he would then get letters from people asking questions, usually just saying, what are your sources on this? I'd like to know more about this. Or, where have you written about such and such? I remember you giving a fireside and I can't find it anywhere. Well, there was no internet. And so uh, you, you couldn't find these. And you couldn't go to the library and look a lot of these up because they were magazine articles 
and there was no you know, topical guide. There was, you know, there's no bibliography. Gary Gillum and, and Lou Midgley and other people started keeping track of this because Nibley would write this and just throw the letter away. He said, well, <laughs> I saw him just go through these things. <laughs> what could he do with them? And he, he even, he could say, yeah, I wrote about that somewhere, but he wasn't sure where it was. And he was cranking these out on his typewriter one, one a month. And by the way, most of those were first drafts. And wow. they are almost polished, perfect first drafts. Heavily footnoted on a manual typewriter. Oh my. I, as someone who never grew up in the typewriter age, I can't even conceive of the challenge that poses. Yeah. Uh, but uh, so first of all, there was a need for bibliography. And uh, people knew that f forever, people would want to know where he had published certain things and how to access it. In a way, it's kind of like what happened in the early church with revelations. Uh, the Doctrine and Covenants was a scrapbook of various revelations that were collected, and some of them were published in the Messenger and Advocate or the Morning and Evening Star. But only a few people had those newspapers, and they were just newspapers, and they weren't durable. And often they were used for starting the fire in, in the oven, you know. <laughs> and then people said, wait a minute, there was a revelation back there. Mm -hmm. And some would talk about it. Many people would hand write their own copies of the revelations, which we found was a little bit risky because sometimes they'd change the words inadvertently. So there was a need to publish them all and gather them in one place. And that's kind of what happened with Nibley as well. Uh, you needed to have what he actually said. What, you know, not just what somebody said he said. So what Farms actually ended up doing was, uh, this was before the internet even was dreamed of, but we kind of created a, a website, an analog website, <laughs> where uh, instead of looking on a website and, you know, searching for an article and clicking on it, you could look down our annual I'm sorry, our yeah, annuals, once a year we put out a catalog with everything that we had offered at, up to that point. And uh, people could then write in and uh, they had a little order form and for 75 cents or a dollar we had a stack of Xerox copies. And instead of downloading the text, you'd get one in the mail. <laughs> Well, finally, we collected these in, uh, by category. And uh, so we had all the Book of Mormon ones in one place. We had all of the Brigham Young stuff in one place. And the catalog just naturally took its organization. That was the organization behind the collected works of Hugh Nibley. So then we pulled those together and said, well, let's just put them in a volume. Let's pull these all together. And uh, so anyway, that's... Uh, we source checked everything. We uh, uh, went through and made everything consistent. Uh, he used a lot of abbreviations. We spelled those out or identified what they were. A lot of things that people said, I can't find Nibley's source on this. Uh, well, they didn't know where to look, for one thing, and the abbreviations were just too cryptic. But we found every one of them. Uh, there was one, one time we had trouble at the end of the uh, book called The World and the Prophets, uh, we started finding that we, uh, and the way we did this was we went to the library and we had given people a list of all the sources cited in The World and the Prophets. And then they would go, and usually all of those sources were in the BYU library because Nibley had bought them or contributed <laughs> them. <laughs> and they had his name and writing in them. But we gathered them all in one room. And then we had people come, and we just sat there and pulled off the books, checked the pages, got all the source checking done. Uh, but we got to the end, the last chapter, and things just went haywire. And finally, I can't remember who it was that figured it out, all of the footnotes were off by one. <laughs> so this was what we were actually looking for, but it pertains to the footnote text before. And how did that happen? Well, in those days, typesetting was not done by computer. And so 
a footnote had been taken out or dropped, or I don't know exactly how it happened in the typesetting, but once you got off by one, all of the footnote numbers, they were endnotes, didn't compare with what the footnotes were in the text. Wow. <laughs> so anyway, that's just a sidelight on uh, you know, how did this all come about and uh, the work that went into the Collected Works project. And yeah, it's huge. Uh, a lot of pages, a lot of text, a lot of languages. And, uh, but for the people who were what we called the Collected Workers of Hugh <laughs> Nibley, uh, most of us had had classes from him, we knew him, we, uh, we worked hard on this, and it was, I wouldn't say it was a, a fraternity or anything like that, but there was a cohesiveness in the group. And everybody brought different skills to the, to the project. And what we at Farms learned was that 20 heads are better than one. And having people with specialties and expertise, we then build on that for, uh, you know, the next uh, decade after most of this work was finished. So clearly, Hugh Nibley the Man and the collected works of Hugh Nibley has had an incalculable influence on Latter-day Saint scholarship. On a personal level, how has Hugh Nibley influenced your life and your work? Well, in a lot of ways. Uh, uh, I, of course, uh, still go to his works regularly for, I did last night, somebody had a question and I found it in chapter 10 of volume 19. <laughs> uh, so as a resource, uh, as a source of joy, uh, Nibley was, was always happy. Uh, except when he was asked to do something he didn't want to do, like he was once asked to be a department chair, and he said, I won't do this. <laughs> and, he said, and the dean said, yes, you will. We all take our turn. And he said, well, I have a box, anything for the dean, everything for the chair, just put in the box. <laughs> and it sat there. <laughs> but he kind of chuckled about that. He was even happy at the, the way that went. But he was very happy in his work. And uh, uh, he, uh, I think he influenced me in uh, uh, wanting to be broad gauged in my scholarship. Uh, I, I know that when I was uh, going to college, being an interdisciplinary scholar was considered the best thing. Mm -hmm. That uh, lots of programs like law and religion were being put together where you finally got lawyers and theologians to talk to each other. Uh, but there were a lot of classes that were being team taught because you had to get two or three people to you know represent these uh, you know history and literature uh, or sometimes uh, uh, science and uh, history of science where somebody, what's going on in the history world and what's going on in science and how do they relate? Well, Nibley could do all of that uh, pretty much by himself, so he didn't team teach with anyone. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, he did influence us all in understanding the importance of uh, being multi-skilled and multitasking. Nibley, uh, I think, was always working on five or six things. He had to be. Uh, whatever class was next, whatever article was due to the improvement era, whatever book, whatever fireside, you know, his mind was able to function in lots of different uh, channels. And at home, too. Uh, he had eight children. He did things with them. They were all involved in art and drama and history and language. And that household was a was a bustling place with just lots of good things. And of course, many visitors. I visited at the home several times. And Christine, one of his daughters, was uh, in a class I had once, uh, a Greek class a while. But uh, this is. Uh, and I want to pause on that for just a minute, too, about his home. Uh, because Nibley influenced me. I had a good home, a great father, a great mother. 
Uh, and so I, I kind of admired and could appreciate what he was doing in his home, too. And it wasn't just Hugh, it was Phyllis as well. And Phyllis was such a jewel. And she's still alive. She's in a uh, memory care unit here in Provo. I visited her not too long ago. But I think there's not much, I don't know anything what's happening this month with her, but, uh, but Phyllis was, she had a wonderful laugh too. She was just a great hostess and welcoming and just loved having people around. And she was also a very bright and astute reader, read all kinds of things. I'm sure that she and Hugh had all kinds of conversations about many of the things that you would then go on and talk about. And not one word in the collected works of Hugh Nibley was published without Phyllis's approval. She was the final proofreader. And I would take the manuscripts down and we'd go through it and she'd, she was pretty quick about it. And she would catch things that you would never expect. But she kind of knew what he was trying to say and, he could say, and she could see there's been something garbled here and we'd get it right. And uh, uh, maybe it's worth a little sidetrack on Phyllis because I know Hugh was, uh, he resented stories that were told about him. Uh, you know, he, he became a legend and mythical and everybody had a Hugh Nibley story to tell. I've told some of them right now. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and, uh, but one of the stories that he didn't like was uh, how he and Phyllis met and got married. And the courtship was not a long one. And, of course, that gets distorted, that he came to Provo and he walked into the BYU housing agency where uh, they didn't have a lot of dormitories there mm -hmm. uh, in the late 40s. And uh, Apostle John A. Widso had said, Hugh, you need to go down to BYU. I want you to go down and work there. You can continue working on things that we've been doing because Hugh had been working with Elder Widso on uh, some church history, and, uh, and that's where he writes the uh, uh, Lehi in the Desert, uh, right back from World War II. And he says, you've got to get down to BYU. And so Hugh comes down and he walks into the office where you could find uh, uh, apartments to rent, or, you know, where, where do I stay? And the Helaman Halls hadn't even been built yet. And, uh, and guess who was there with the list of available spaces? Her name was Phyllis. Wow. And uh, they chatted and, you know, and she was charming. And uh, Hugh came back later and asked her out for a picnic date and they went. And, uh, and like I said, the courtship wasn't very long, but he, he knew a lot of people. Uh, he had been to... Uh, graduate school in California, he had been in the war, he had been, you know, he was a judge of character and uh, he was not a slow study on anything dealing with human nature and uh, he got the right one with Phyllis and so she was a big part of what we did and uh, I appreciate all that she did. So that left an impression on me too that uh, uh, you know, marriage is, uh, well, there's no decision more important than that in any of our lives. And it's not just more important, but more valuable, more meaningful, more what life is really all about. Hugh understood that. And uh, so there was that, but let me tell one other little story because, uh, uh, of course, people are well aware that I discovered chiasmus in the uh, Book of Mormon as a missionary in Germany. I served in South Germany where Hugh Nibley had served back in the 1920s. Uh, and so we had stories we swapped over, you know. It was very different uh, after World War II than uh, when he was there uh, in the late 20s. But uh, his German was so good uh, he, linguistically, he was very gifted, and musically as well, but his memory was really sharp. But he could, uh, 
another little sidetrack, uh, he could pass for a, uh, uh, a native German. And not just casually on the street, but he was an intelligence officer who would walk into Nazi offices and ask for maps and be given them, wow. wearing a Nazi uniform. <laughs> he was in the intelligence uh, division of the, uh, of the army and was right there on the front lines. But, uh, but because of my esteem for Nibley and uh, you know, one of the first things I wanted to do when I got back from my mission was to report, to go tell him what I'd found. Uh, I had written with, to a few people, but not a lot, uh, during the second year of my mission. But I had discovered probably 30 or 40 really good chiasms uh, in the Book of Mormon already. And I had talked to German scholars in, uh, in Munich, in Landshut, in Innsbruck, in Regensburg. Uh, it was a good door opener. Uh, I'm a Mormon missionary. I'm here to talk about the Book of Mormon. Book of Mormon? I wouldn't take that seriously. Would you like me to show you an interesting text in the Book of Mormon? <laughs> well, yeah. <laughs> I mean, I, I was actually able to have some pretty good conversations with people on that. I wanted to tell him what, uh, how I had used that. Now, I assumed that he knew something about chiasmus. But, uh, in fact, I, my first night we'd driven up from Los Angeles, uh, and it was 9.30 at night, and I said, I want to go over and just knock on Hugh's door. He, I know he was a night owl. He, he kept late hours, and I said, maybe the kids are in bed and I can, I can talk. So I went down, knocked on the door, and, and, uh, and in fact, uh, Christine answered the door and said, hey, Dad, some guy's here. <laughs> <laughs> and he came, uh, you know, bustling down the stairs, and he re recognized me, and, and I said, well, I'm back from my mission in Germany, and, oh, come on in, tell me what happened, you know, and so we sat and talked for a while. I said, well, I do have something I'd like to, to share, share with you. Uh, uh, have you. What do you know about chiasmus? And he said, not really very much. Why? And I pulled out this book and that book, and I, I started telling him what I'd done and, and what I'd seen. And I had, this, I had a briefcase full of a lot of these papers. We were there until the wee hours of the night. He wanted me to tell him everything I'd learned, every book I'd read, every scholar I'd talked to. It was just like Christmas morning, opening, <laughs> opening this. And he, he said, this, this is amazing. Where have we been? He, he would often say this. <laughs> Why didn't we see this before? Here's another <laughs> thing that, that just uh, had, you know, escaped our attention. Well, before I left, he said, you must write a master's thesis on this subject, and I will be on your thesis committee. I don't know this for sure, but I don't think he ever was on another thesis committee that I've been able to, to tell. Oh, I, didn't know that. I don't know. Uh, he may have been. I, I'm just not aware of it. But, but I didn't even know he would. And I wasn't even a graduate student. <laughs> I said, well, I haven't graduated yet. I don't care. We'll get started on it. <laughs> <laughs> Such confidence. Well, but that kind of encouragement, how do you think that influenced yeah. somebody just back from their mission? And it takes so much time, spend in to the wee hours of the night with someone fresh off their mission and to inspire a lifelong career. Yeah, it did. And, uh, and he wasn't just talk. I mean, he actually followed through with that. Read drafts, talked to me gave me suggestions, uh, pointed out things that, uh, and I would bring things and say, what do you think about this? You see how this might relate? Oh yeah, and we'd, you know, so he was a big influence on me. But he, uh, just to finish up that little story, uh, as uh, I, you know, got up to leave, he kind of chased me, you know, kept, kept talking, kept going. <laughs> As he always kept talking as he left a room, well, we just kept talking as I walked out the front door. And then as we stood on the porch, and then I said, well, it's getting late, I, you know. And he stood there, and oh yeah, I guess it is time. Uh, 
But then he said, young man, uh, I think you have made the first significant discovery to come out of the BYU. Oh, wow. That's quite the compliment. <laughs> well, I've often said Nibley liked to speak in tempered hyperbole. <laughs> and this was, of course, hyperbolic. But, uh, but to me, it was a validation that uh, uh, this was a path that I needed to pursue. So anyway, that's been a big part of what I've done, and, uh, and that's why I wanted to repay the favor by uh, you know, doing all of the collected works of Hugh Nibley to be sure that he was remembered and that people will have access to his, uh, his corpus. And so one of Hugh Nibley's great contributions was studying the Book of Mormon. And uh, that's what you've made in large part your life's work of is studying the Book of Mormon. And you've brought to the table, as you've talked about, chiasmus and other connections from the ancient world, ancient temple work. Hugh Nibley brought to the table all those things and also uh, specifically ancient Arabia, which hadn't really been done up until that point. And so now that you've been a student of Hugh Nibley and now you're a prodigious scholar yourself and you've seen the progression of Book of Mormon studies, where do you see the future of Book of Mormon studies going? What other areas should we be plumbing the depths of to be getting the most out of this text? Well, of course, we don't know what the next discovery will be. Nibley couldn't have told you in 1960 that uh, he would write a book called Since Camorra, subtitled Simps Qumran, <laughs> all about the, uh, what the Dead Sea Scrolls has opened up. But uh, uh, there are a lot of these other texts that still do need to be explored. Uh, it's not just an ancient textual matter, though. I, I think that uh, uh, we now have the equipment to do a better job of really understanding the Book of Mormon on its own terms, not on our terms, but on its terms. Who were these people? Uh, what was their life like? What would it have been like to uh, think uh, like Alma in his circumstances? And, you know, uh, you mentioned a lot of my own work and Nibley's, like Nibley, uh, one of the things I've specialized in is uh, biblical law. And I don't think that we've gotten to the bottom of the biblical law foundation of Nephite life. They do tell us that they kept and were exceedingly strict in keeping the law of Moses. Now, of course, the law of Moses gets fulfilled, but it does not get relegated to the scrap barrel uh, because in 4th Nephi they do say that they did keep the commandments. And everything that Jesus is saying is, is not uh, obliterating the past, but fulfilling the past. And I've not come to destroy, but to fulfill, he says. And then he goes on and quotes Isaiah and Malachi. And, you know, why is he doing that if, if the, uh, you know, the, the prophetic and uh, legal materials that were given by him uh, weren't still relevant? I think we've been a little uh, too quick to, uh, uh, I don't, I don't know say, say about quick. I just don't think we've finished the job yet in that regard, and I'd like to see more done along that line. Uh, but uh, uh, that's just one, one avenue. Uh, I think that uh, we still haven't understood properly the development within the Book of Mormon itself. How do ideas change? The more we know about how societies work, uh, they appropriate older ideas and maybe modify a little bit how they, they are now understood. But, they, but modern societies uh, still can build on the concepts and especially the values. I, I give you one example of the past that were important. Uh, 
I think that we need to look a lot more at duties and obligations and what it is that makes duties important and communities important. In the last little while, uh, I suppose in my generation, uh, it began to uh, emphasize more rights, what are my rights, and my individuality. And that's a good thing. But no individual is an island. There's a good poem about that. <laughs> Uh, we're all a part of the main. And human beings, Aristotle taught us, do not exist as individuals. O anthropos politikon so on est, Aristotle said. Humanity, man, is a political being. He didn't mean political in the sense of political parties, but belonging to a polis, to a city. That People cannot survive as individuals. They have to have communities and other people. And, and that means that you have obligations and duties. And I think that these duties actually arise out of your rights. Because if you have a right, you have a power. And if you have a power, you then have a moral obligation to use it appropriately. That's what a power is all about. And that means there's the risk that you might use it inappropriately. Well, the Book of Mormon is full of this doctrine of choice of the two ways. And we are given certain rights and powers, but we can see the consequences when those rights are not used appropriately or effectively or for the best purposes. Uh, so I, I think that these old ideas are still very much contemporary, and that's another thread that will help to uh, to bring the Book of Mormon to you know to our uh, to our needs. Uh, I think the Book of Mormon is underrated uh, in a lot of ways. Uh, sometimes people have misunderstood it as being racist. I don't see it as racist at all. There were racial problems in those days, but the prophets in the Book of Mormon are constantly trying to for work against that. And the best experiences that you have in the Book of Mormon is when you finally get people together. Right. And borders are dropped, and you can actually, heal them in chapter 6, you can finally go from the land of Nephi to the land of Zarahemla and back and forth. And, you know, sure, there were problems there, but... Uh, Let's not miss, you know, what the book is really trying to tell us. So we, we can't read selectively. So I think, I don't know if that's, you know, just a, a, a tip of an iceberg. I know there are a lot of good things going on with uh, uh, linguistics, etymologies of names, archaeology. Uh, you know better than anyone how many <laughs> evidences there are, how many... Uh, uh, factors that are relevant and uh, it's that expansive knowledge that uh, uh, I guess can't be really uh, <clears throat> you, can't, you can't just boil it down to a single charge here's what we need to do with the Book of Mormon I'd say the fullness of the gospel is something we need to keep in mind as we read the Book of Mormon going forward. And it goes back to the idea about specialization. If you become a specialist, uh, you, you lose a lot. I mean, you, you may be able to drill down deep on one hole, but you kind of burrow down and lose perspective, I think. Uh, but you have to drill down as well, but you have to come up for air every now and then and see what's going on in the world. Mm -hmm. And I'd like to uh, hope that uh, that something that Elder Maxwell once said would guide us as we go through Book of Mormon studies in the future. Uh, it was, uh, he said that, uh, first of all, practice and belief are both important that you have to have orthodoxy and orthopraxy, that we are not 
monks living in a cell just thinking about things and that's orthodoxy. You know, orthodoxy means straight opinions. Uh, but, uh, but we also have to be active and doing and engaged in the works of righteousness. That's orthopraxy. But some people kind of say, well, it's doing or it's thinking. And that's the old conundrum that, that uh, you know, are we saved by grace and works? Are we saved by grace or by works? Well, it's both. Mm -hmm. And what Maxwell said in the end was, the doctrines of the church all have to be brought into, into uh, uh, discussion and awareness together. And that just as faith and works need each other, all of the doctrines of the church need each other as much as human beings need each other. And that if you take any one doctrine, and that becomes kind of your specialty. And that's all you need is love. Okay, or whatever it might be. All you need is testimony. Or all No, what you need is all. And all of them have to be there. And he said that the reason for that is that the doctrines of the church are so powerful, each one of them, that if they are focused on individually, they tend to spin out of control and go wild. In a, some, in a simpler way, they say you end up riding your hobby horse out of the church mm -hmm. because that's your hobby horse. But what you have to do is keep the fullness of the gospel, all of the blessings and all of the commandments and all of life because God is eternal. God is omni-everything and that means all. So I would hope that Book of Mormon Studies would in the future take all of these pieces that we've found and find ways to uh, show how they uh, are even more powerful as they work together. Certainly being well-rounded while still being very uh, specialized is a, a huge challenge no matter what. But I'm very excited to see what the future of Book of Mormon Studies holds as long as we're grounded in the fullness of the gospel of Jesus Christ and in the scholarship that's come before. So just one last quick story, uh, if you'd be willing to share, you wrote a chapter on Hugh Nibley and the Book of Mormon, and obviously that's both, uh, both of you have a lot of experience with that, but instead of starting your chapter with something ancient or historical, you open up with a story about Hugh Nibley advancing on Utah Beach on D-Day. What does World War II have to do with the Book of Mormon? Uh, well, uh, Hugh, like most soldiers, uh, didn't often talk about the war. Uh, it wasn't a pleasant experience. My own father was uh, uh, among the uh, German, uh, the, the troops in Germany uh, right after World War II. And uh, he didn't like to talk about it either. But uh, so it was on some kind of personal and special occasions that he he would talk about this. And uh, I didn't ask him the question, but I remember him being asked one. So when did you get your testimony of the Book of Mormon? Tell me how it happened. And he talked about coming up out of the water as he was driving that Jeep onto the beach with the machine guns firing at them and driving up and realizing the Book of Mormon is true. Wow. That's where he got his testimony. And why? Well, as they'd been bouncing around out there, coming across the uh, English Channel in the middle of the choppy night, he'd been reading the book of Jared, uh, the story of the Jaredites, the book of Ether, <laughs> and especially the last chapters about the insanity of the war of mutual annihilation. And he realized that he'd read that story many times and he just dismissed it as mythological. This was a fable. This had been exaggerated by tradition or historians. And he said, no, this is real. And the Book of Mormon is just as real as this. But it was more than just that realization. Uh, he wasn't thinking about that. It was the Spirit telling him at that point, the Book of Mormon is true. 
And that, that not only helped him through that day, but through the rest of his life. He never forgot that experience. So I thought that was a good place to start. Certainly, a very haunting way to receive your testimony of the Book of Mormon. But the story of the Book of Mormon is, is not a fairy tale, it's a tragedy in many ways. And so I, I think it's a really appropriate way for Hugh Nibley to, to get that spark to set him on a lifelong journey of scholarship. Well, I really appreciate your perspectives and experiences well, with Hugh Nibley. And so thank thanks. you for being willing to share these with us. Well, it's a blessing to be able to uh, be a part of this. And this book that's come together uh, will make Nibley more understandable. Uh, you know, I, I think it's not an exaggeration to put Nibley in the league with Shakespeare in terms of, you know, volume of things published. Uh, I think that Nibley materials, they're not as entertaining as some of the Shakespeare plays, of <laughs> course. Uh, but with other people, it helps you to know the author, to be able to uh, appreciate, or the artist, uh, what they're trying to communicate with their work. And I think to the rising generations, uh, Without this kind of, uh, of understanding about who was Hugh Nibley and uh, uh, what drove him and inspired him, uh, it will be, uh, uh, you know, it would be possible for, for him to, uh, you know, simply fade into uh, the collective memory, but not the, uh, you know, the real specific awareness of the rising generation, as is maybe already happening. There are a few who remember B.H. Roberts, but that was, you know, a hundred years ago. But B.H. Roberts was, you know, he, he was a different kind of influence, but he was a very powerful influence in the church, uh, as was James E. Talmadge. But they didn't have the kind of training that uh, Nibley does. Of course, they, they had prophetic authority as an apostle or 70, which Nibley never had. Uh, but, uh, but I think as, as the world goes forward and uh, people look back on what, what can help us now, we're in that Jeep right now. And we're landing on battlefields. What will help us through our challenges? And I think having Nibley on our team and on our side, he doesn't have all the answers, but he usually has all the perspectives that will help us. And so I, I hope this book will serve that function in uh, being a collective memory by a lot of people. This is a big book, but I think it's, uh, it's successful because it lets each one of us speak and our experiences with Nibley, each of which were uh, quite personal, quite unique. Nibley had his fans, Nibley had his opponents, but he, uh, like he said, uh, we must engage in the debate or you lose by default. And uh, we don't want to do that. Beautifully put. Thank you very, very much.